This video is going to be a bit more serious than my last video about how to help RC racing as a hobby grow. Not too long ago, my local track, AJC Speedway, closed down, and it got me thinking about the state of RC racing in the modern world. It was at this point I got a few different messages on Facebook and YouTube about other small tracks closing down. It got me thinking as to why this is happening. Why exactly are small RC tracks closing down? Is this an issue of 10 scale versus 8 scale? And why do so many people have so many different answers to the same question? Now it's important to note before I begin, I'm not going to get political with this video as it doesn't have much to do with RC and never really has. Also, this video is coming from the perspective of someone who isn't going to large scale events too often like the Surf City Classic or even the Roar Regionals, at least not quite yet. Without further delay, let's get started. In researching for this video and this segment specifically, I've come to something close to a conclusion, and that's that RC racing as a whole is very, very fragmented. Let me explain. It seems like every large event has their own rules on what is and isn't legal. One track might ban slicks outright where another might only use them. One track might only run stock motors where the other one's mod. This is fine on a club level as every track is different and will need some level of differing rules, but this seems to be the case with large events where some of the best drivers in the world compete as well. Unfortunately, because of this fragmentation in rules between events, it's hard for an average racer to keep up, especially for someone on a budget who wants to compete at some larger events. This is especially a problem for A skills as tires are expensive. If you go into a race event with a bunch of tires only to realize they aren't race regal, then you might be the end of your race day, or even race weekend depending on your budget. There are some unifying bodies out there like IFMAR for international races and ROAR for US based races, but not everyone is a huge fan of them for reasons I listed prior. Having specific rules that don't make too much sense, to be honest. It ranges from the normal, but annoying, like only being able to run roar proof motors, ESCs, and batteries, to the bizarre, like having your windows be clear and see through. I'm also aware of some drama that happened at the Roar National for 8 scale not too long ago. I'm not really into Nitro, so I'm not going to sit here and pretend to know exactly why what happened happened. I'm just going to say that being less than a CC above the fuel limit really sucks. Anyway, my point is, RC racing is a fragmented sport that needs to be unified in some way, shape, or form. This is something I mentioned in my previous video about how to help the hobby grow, but it really needs to be said again. With the exception of Traxxas maybe, RC companies really don't know how to market in the modern world. To those of you who recently got into RC racing, when was the last time you heard of S-Works, Serpent, or even Hot Bodies if you're only into 10 scale? For some of you, this is the first time you've heard these names or even seen these logos. This is because these companies and RC as a whole simply don't do a good job of advertising their brands to the general public the same way they did back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Think about it. When was the last time you saw a video ad from literally any RC racing company? When was the last time you saw an online ad from a racing brand when you weren't already on an RC site? Even when a new RC racing rig comes out, there isn't much of a fuss when it does come out outside of the race community, and a lot of times, I don't even know when it's going to come out until it's listed on A-Main for pre-order. Keep in mind, I'm not exactly inactive online. The only company that I know of that posts things about when their cars are coming out is X-Ray, and they usually do it yearly. Instead of doing online ads themselves, RC manufacturers usually put this test on their sponsored drivers, but not the sponsored drivers you may be expecting. Again, this is something I talked about in my last video about how to help the hobby grow, and that's that RC companies want their factory drivers to be employees, competitive drivers, social media personalities, and customer service, all at the same time. In the end, they aren't able to focus on one specific thing and end up being a jack of all trains but master of none. That is, if they actually stuck to that. Unfortunately, the only thing that a lot of factories care about is race standings and placements at big races. Back in the 80s and early 90s, whoever won at a big race, their brand sponsor would usually go on to be the best seller among lower tier drivers later on. These days, it doesn't work that way. These days, it's whatever is most popular and easy to acquire that's most importantly, what's center stage online. Don't believe me? At the 2019 IFMAR Worlds, there wasn't a single TLR two-wheel drive in the A-Main and only one in the four-wheel drive A-Main. Yet one of, not, one of, if not the most popular RC racing brand in the US is Team Losi Racing. 
This isn't because Dakota Fend has won pretty much every big race this year, but because TLR and Horizon Hobby have put themselves center stage online not just in Facebook and Twitter, but most importantly, YouTube. A lot of you may not know who Dakota Fend is, but I'm willing to wager most of you know who Ryan Harris is. He's probably the largest RC racing channel out there, and can you guess what brand he runs these days? That's right, it's Losi. Yes, of course, you may bring up Team Associate as a counter-argument here, or they're the exception, not the rule. If RC companies really want to make an impact and grow, they really need to reach out to more online personalities that already exist, rather than try to make one out of a factory driver. One thing I wanted to mention was the difference between indoor tracks and outdoor tracks, and why one is more popular than the other these days, at least in the South, and the other seems to be on the downturn. Outdoor racing is probably the most popular here in the southern US and probably the whole country. First off, you need to understand the world of RC, 8th scale as a whole. 8th scale racing needs a lot of space, and finding a permanent residence that can accommodate the speeds and space needed is difficult at the best of times. And for reasons I'll get to in a second, these are not the best of times. It's much easier to rent or own a spot of land than it is to own a building that needs appropriate accommodations like electricity, central heating, air conditioning, safety measures, so on and so forth. Not only that, but running nitro buggies and truggies indoors ex for extended periods of time is, well, not a very good idea if you value your sanity. Not only that, but because you can usually run all classes on an outdoor track, including 10th scale, outdoor seems like an ideal racing experience. There are a few problems, though. First off, you have the issue of, well, The elements can have both a large and unavoidable effect on track conditions. Couple with this with the amount of times cars will run through the actual track line, and you have a track that will change throughout the day. This can either be a good or a bad thing depending on what your tastes are, but for me it's kind of just neutral. In the same day vein, race days on outdoor tracks are usually at the mercy of mother nature, and she can be a bit of a troll. Sometimes unforeseen rain happens, and unless the track has a good drainage system and the rain stops relatively quickly, your race day is over, and that's what brings us to indoor tracks. Indoor tracks usually house 10th scale racing and a sprinkling of e-buggy and e-truggy from time to time. They tend to have an advantage over their outdoor counterparts in that they are usually immune from being shut down by weather. Unless there is a huge tornado, hurricane, or earthquake, there probably will be a race that day. Not only that, but the track conditions can be kept under a very controlled environment. It could be as grippy or as loose as you want it to be, and in the case of Carpet or Astro, cleanup on the cars is almost non-existent. This doesn't mean there aren't drawbacks, chief among them being tire prep. Holy crap, the tire prep. If you watched Ryan Harris's video on Masters of Dirt during his interview section to so outside, all you'll hear as the background is a constant whining of electric drills in the background. Multiply that by hundreds of drivers all doing the same thing to get more grip out of the car, and you have a recipe for a splitting migraine. However, this is the least of indoor track owners' problems these days. Let me explain. After 2020, and a little thing I will now refer to as the bricks for fear of YouTube taking this video down, lots of things changed. Now you might be expecting me to talk about the initial lockdown due to the bricks, but that's only the short-term effects. The long-term effects are far more destructive in my opinion. Before we get to that, however, we need to understand why RC tracks, specifically indoor ones, are in the locations they are. I've gotten a few different people asking me how there aren't more RC tracks in highly populated areas like New York City or Long Island, but they seem to be everywhere in the outskirts of cities and in the country. Well, it's less a question of population and more a question of cost, specifically real estate costs. Property values in these highly populated areas is very high. And because running an RC track isn't the most lucrative business, and with the amount of space you need even for a small track like the late AJC Speedway, you have a recipe for a lack of tracks. It's why indoor tracks are usually out in the country, or more importantly in industrial parks where rent is a lot cheaper, but these days, even these areas aren't safe. Thanks to the bricks, for a lot, a lot of people had to stay home for a long period of time. Because of this, people simply didn't go out to buy stuff as much as they did. Instead, they simply ordered stuff online, and because people were now buying stuff online, the demand for warehouses that could hold inventory, you know, the same places that indoor tracks tend to inhabit, rent for these places started to soar as the demand increased. Couple this with the fact that once again, RC is not really a lucrative business for track owners, 
They simply can't keep up with these increases in rent if they don't already ha own the building they run, which in the case of AJC, they didn't. Even after the bricks have subsided, the use of online stores and the demand for warehouses to hold inventory is still there, and we as racers unfortunately have to suffer. With all of these being said, you may think RC is on its last leg, but that isn't really the truth. If you pick apart any hobby or sport, you can find things to improve, and that's what I did. In truth, RC racing has never been more popular. Thanks to the bricks, more and more people are looking to get into new hobbies, and RC has been a popular choice. Large race events like Psycho Nitro Blast and Masters of Dirt have had the most amount of entries they've ever had, and even small club races have had large success as of recently as the bricks have started to die down. RC is far from dead, and I don't even think it's dying. It will bounce back, just like it always has. That's all for now. If you liked this video, feel free to hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, if you want to add your voice to the discuss discussion, feel free to comment down below as this is meant to be a discussion. Also, if you want to support me further and want to have updates on what my next videos are going to be, be sure to check out my Patreon. Speaking of which, I'd like to thank my patrons Michael Williams, Lucas Tarka, RC World Discord Server, Casey Nix, and Ben Reeves. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you later.